Council special meeting. This is a meeting number 22 for the 1996-97 year. It's May 5th, 1997. Could we have the roll call, please? Chairman McLaughlin? Here. Council Cogsall? Here. Council Groff? Here. Council Jordan? Here. Council Linnell? Here. Council McGinty? Here. Council Reed? Here. Thank you. Would you please join me in the pledge to the flag? I pledge, pledge allegiance, allegiance to the flag of the United States, States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. First thing this evening is reports and correspondence. Do we have any from councillors? Councillor Groff. Once in a while, as the most junior member of the council, I get to do something worthwhile, though not too often. Um, tonight, I get to thank our chairperson and Phyllis, because this is their last meeting. And I think it's uh, really important that we take a moment in this busy evening to recognize the contribution of both uh, Janet and Phyllis to this town. Janet and Phyllis both joined the council nine years ago, but each had prior service in the community. Janet served as the library trustee and as the chairman of the library board. While on the library board, she was instrumental in helping organize support for an expanded library, which led to the expansion of the library into the Pond Cove Annex Building and the development of the community room and library corridor, which has uh, housed many art exhibitions in this town. And Phyllis served as the chairman of the Zoning Board of Appeals for several years, and that uh, certainly was beneficial in her service here on the Council and the Ordinance Committee. And Janet, while she was in, during her nine years, uh, was on the Appointments Committee, and she helped to recruit many of our outstanding volunteers that have made this town what it is today. Both Janet and Phillips have served two years as Town Council Chairman and two terms as Finance Committee Chair. And Phyllis served as Chairman of the Zoning Ordinance Revision Committee, and both were active in promoting the purchase of the Community Center and the acquisition of Portland Headlight and the related development of museum in Portland Headlight. The town has benefited from the acquisition of over, over 250 acres of open space during their service on the council. Open burning ceased at the refuge disposal area, and the town initiated an award-winning recycling program. The town center planning process occurred, and the town's bond rating increased twice during their tenure, and many improvements were made to our school buildings, the town hall, Fort Williams Park, and to all the services provided by the town. You know, in short, both these individuals had an impact on the community in which all of us live. To me, uh, I haven't always agreed with Phyllis. I haven't always agreed with Janet. But the one thing was clear, and that was they cared deeply about this town and they stuck to their principles of what they believed was best for this town in the long run. And I personally am deeply appreciative of their efforts and really believe that they're an example of what a citizen can do in a small town to have an impact. So at this time, on behalf of all the citizens of Cape Elizabeth, and I'm sure on behalf of all my fellow councilors, I would like to Thank you for all your service to Cape Elizabeth. The citizens appreciate it. Councilors appreciate it. And I appreciate your help this last year. Thank you very much. And I know you're both going to remain active uh, in your own way in town affairs. And that's to the benefit of all of us. Thanks again. Tempts me to say meeting adjourned, but if you want to <laughs> are you waiting for me to say something? <laughs> I just I want to thank all the voters and citizens of Cape Elizabeth for voting for me and giving me the opportunity to serve you all, and um, I'll still be watching. Thank you. 
Phyllis and I talked before the meeting. We knew this was coming, fortunately, else it may have been a, we might not have been quite as composed. <laughs> At least I wouldn't have been. It's been a very humbling and educational experience. And it's the people that make this town work, and it's a wonderful, wonderful bunch of people, starting with the manager, the staff, the department heads, the council, and especially the citizens. And I sincerely thank you for the last nine years. Ms. Lane. One more thing. Um, it's my privilege and honor at this time to present to you, Janet, your gavel. Um, it's been a fun nine years in Phyllis. It's really been a pleasure to work with you. Um, I feel good about presenting you the gavel. I know <laughs> you feel good about receiving it. Um, and again, we look forward to uh, many more of your years in serving the citizens of the community. So okay. at this time, Janet, your Chairman Gavel for the 1996-1997 year. Comment being in how infrequently I've used a gavel. You never know. Thank you very much. Anybody else this evening? Reports and correspondence for the council. All right, I have a few. Um, the council has signed two letters this evening. One is going to Reverend John Feeney who is retiring as pastor at St. Bartholomew's Church. He's had an impact on residents of all denominations in this community and especially been active in promoting activities for the senior citizens. And I know how very deeply he's going to be missed. He's done a wonderful job, and we wish him Godspeed in his next adventures. The second letter is to Sergeant Donald Tubbs. I had the privilege a couple of weeks ago to join County Commissioner Lyle Kramer and his wife, Police Chief Dave Pickering, and our manager Mike McGovern at a dinner in Bar Harbor honoring Sergeant Tubbs as the main deer officer of the year. And I have to say that I always, I haven't always been, in my own mind, a strong supporter of the deer program. But if you could have been with us that evening and heard the young lady who spoke about what deer had done for her and her life, I think you, like I, have increased your very sincere support for that kind of program in our schools. And I was very honored to think that we had the State Deer Officer of the Year. And we congratulate Sergeant Tubbs for that honor. There will be more information coming, I'm sure, in the Cape Courier. But indeed, this is the month of May. And at the end of May, we will be having a Memorial Day parade. The date is Monday, May 26th. I can't tell you all the details yet because I don't know them. But please put that on your calendar. It's generally a wonderful day. And I'm assuming there will be a reception at the fire station afterwards. The fire chief is nodding affirmatively. So <laughs> that's something else to look forward to. There is a potential that we, this will be the only council meeting this month. It was announced as a special meeting. Our regular meeting is scheduled for May 12th. I'm fully hoping, expecting, quite determined that we will fully get through our agenda this evening and will not have need for another meeting this month. Reminder to the council and to the public that tomorrow evening, Tuesday, May 6th at 5.30. We are partaking in a site walk at Fort Williams. The town has a proposal before the planning board for improvements to the cliff walk at Fort Williams. We will be convening at the circle down by the lighthouse at 5.30. I would like to congratulate the Cape Elizabeth School Board on a recent action that they took. And I imagine the entire council very easily joins me in this congratulations on the announcement of a superintendent. I know it's been a very long, hard search over a couple of years. And I would ask Beth Currier, the, super, the, yeah, the, super, the chairman of the school board, if she'd like to just come down and announce that publicly, please. <laughs> Wonderful timing. <laughs> 
I'm glad I just walked in at the right time from the baseball field. We are um, thrilled to announce that Cynthia Moles, our interim superintendent for this year, has agreed to a two-year contract as the superintendent um, starting this July 1st. And we are thrilled. It's been a long process. And um, we are thrilled to have her. Thank you. Thanks. Congratulations, Cynthia. Congratulations to the school board. Later this week, somebody sitting up here is going on a wonderful, wonderful trip. And you can tell I'm very green with envy. Mr. McGovern is partaking in an ICMA, International Town and Cities Managers Association, close enough, <coughs> manager exchange. Some of you are aware that last fall we had a manager visiting with his wife here from Australia. So on Wednesday, Michael starts his 14-hour plane ride to Australia. He will be gone a month, and I'm sure having a wonderful time learning about a host of things ranging from park management to what else are you learning? Efficient operation of government. Ah, that was it. <laughs> <laughs> we are sending him off with a about a seven-minute video that has been put together by Eric Messerschmidt, our cable TV producer, and narrated by oh God. Jim. <laughs> Jim Brunel. I'm sorry, Jim. Um, it's the script uh, that Councillor Cogswell and I worked on. I don't think we did too badly rewriting the history of Cape Elizabeth, but we put a few special twists in it. And I'm certainly hoping that you enjoy it as much as we do. I don't know if you've seen it or heard it yet, but it's good. And now. <laughs> Trust me. Ms. Lane, do you want to tell us what's going to be going on tomorrow? The municipal election will be held tomorrow for town council and school board seats. The polls are open at the high school gymnasium from 7 a.m. until 8 p.m. Great. Can we tell them what Councilor Groff said? You mean vote early, vote often? That was it. No, <laughs> no that was just no, for us. That was just for us, sorry. <laughs> we have three sets of minutes this evening. Uh, minutes from the regular March meeting and from two special regular April meetings. Sorry, I'm messed up a month. And from two special meetings since then. There, uh, meetings number 19, 20, and 21. And I entertain a motion on those minutes. Move yep. approval. Thank you. Second a motion as printed. All those in favor. 7-0. Thank you. This is the first of two opportunities this evening for anyone who would like to address the council on any items that are not on the agenda for this evening. Is there anybody who would like to avail themselves of that at this time? All right. Seeing none. This evening we have a basically two public hearings. The first is on our proposed zoning ordinance. The second is on the proposed budget. What I would like to do for each of these public hearings, if there are any counselors who have proposed revisions to be discussed during the public hearing item, if they would present those up front initially before we open the floor to the public so that the public will know what exactly is on our minds and what they could be responding to. I think that will make it a more efficient process for us this evening. Is there anybody who, um, on the council who wants to make any proposed changes to the zoning ordinance draft that was prepared for us this evening? Councillor Reid. Um, Madam Chairman, I'd be very interested in uh, hearing what um, the public has to say, but I would be um, not averse to um, deleting reference to the scenic overlay district. All right. Thank you. <clears throat> Councilor Jordan. I agree with Councilor Reed and what she has put forward, and I hope we take a hard look at it. And also, one thing that I want brought out, and if it isn't within the public hearing, I'll bring it out, is I can't understand why we are proposing 
80,000 square feet on the left-hand side of Ocean House Road going down towards the Cape and 10,000 on the other side. I just, I got to have some, but he explained that to me. Thank you, sir. Anybody else? <clears throat> Excuse me. I had a proposal. It was, yeah. oh, Councilor Linnell, sorry. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairman. I guess I'd uh, piggyback with what Councilors Reed and Jordan said. Uh, I, it would be fine with me if we deleted the reference to the scenic overlay district. All right, do you have anything else? That's all for now, thanks. Okay. On the green colored paper you have before you this evening, I had a proposal, and I thank our planner, Maureen O'Meara, for getting this into print form for me uh, relative to the town center district right now. Throughout the town center district, single family dwelling units are required to have an 80,000 square foot lot. We had seen previously a proposal that the council had asked, had um, developed and asked the planning board to comment on to reduce that requirement of lot size to 20,000 square feet for a part of the town center district, basically running, <coughs> excuse me, from the north, I guess, side of the public safety building property to the, help me out with that boundary, um, I think to the corner. Is that right? <laughs> okay. Um, my proposal is taking, taken from what the planning board sent back to us that we consider it be 10,000 square feet rather than 20,000 square feet and that it requires site plan review by the planning board. And I guess Councilor Jordan in a manner of fashion, that's somewhat of a reply to your question, why it's 80 on one side and 10 or 20 on the other side. That is something that the council had discussed for making a separate sub-district within the town center zone, which is already in existence. The fact that we're discussing things before a public hearing in no way diminishes the Council's willingness and eagerness, basically, to hear what you folks have to say to us tonight. We want to hear your comments. We want to hear your suggestions. After the public comment, there will be Council discussion. There may be new proposals put forth by the Council. Any Councilor can make a proposed amendment on any item that is before us this evening. So I just want everyone to understand that. Are there any questions, concerns from the council at this point? All right, Councilor McGinty. Who who exactly is putting forward this uh, the town center district change from 20 to 10 and the uh, site plan review? Who, which councilor are you making that? I am. Okay. And that is what the planning board had recommended back to us. All right. Is there anybody in the, from the public? I will open the public hearing. Ah, I'm sorry. Let's before we do that, let me back up. Um, our town planner, Maureen O'Meara, who has worked more than endless hours on this, is going to give us a brief overview, summation of a good two years of effort, two and a half years of effort. Thank you. And I will try to be brief, but I'm also going to try to make sure that we're all in the right color. This, <laughs> this is the document that's being reviewed tonight, so anyone who has any other colored copy has an old copy, and this is what the council ought to be working on tonight. Um, Mark told me not to mention how many meetings we have been meeting, so I won't, but I will, just in order to put this into context, remind the council that uh, this process started a couple of years ago, and the original intent was to write a zoning ordinance that was user-friendly, to put the current zoning ordinance in a format that was cohesive, internally consistent, and as you got into the process, very quickly realized that if the time and effort was going to be spent into rewriting the zoning ordinance, that perhaps the recommendations in the comprehensive plan should also be incorporated. So that's the document you have tonight. Uh, you appointed a town center, uh, excuse me, a zoning ordinance rewrite committee who met for several months and came up with a draft. Um, they 
went through a process which included articles to the Cape Courier, uh, public forums, a call-in show. They referred the whole document to the council, and the council and the planning board jointly met for six workshops reviewing the entire document, again, page by page, line by line. There were additional public forums, additional articles in the Courier. Uh, there have been many series of notices sent out. Um, and what you have tonight is a document and a set of maps. And what I'd like to do is very briefly go over the maps, just so you know exactly what you're being proposed to um, look at this evening. This is the new zoning map. And the difference between this map and the map you saw in April is it now has the town center subdistrict right in this area right here. Other than that, it has the same changes that you've seen before, including the RB districts. Um, this map here is a map you have never seen before. This is the new uh, scenic area overlay district map. And there are three scenic areas, scenic overlay zones proposed. Uh, what we did is we took the 8.5 by 11 map that was in the visual assessment report and we overlaid it onto a parcel map so you now can see exactly which parcels are affected by it. Uh, the green are the high priority scenic areas and the two yellow right in here are the medium priority scenic areas. So all this does is take the map that was in the visual resources assessment and make it specific enough so someone can see whether or not their lot is in or outside of that district. And the, all the regulations surrounding this district right now are written as voluntary, so they're not required items that someone has to comply with. This is the Great Pond watershed map, and you've seen this one before. We made a small change in this area, and this is, shows the lots that are affected by the Great Pond watershed <coughs> district. And then the last one is the transfer of development rights map. This has not changed in a while, so this is something you've all seen before. Um, just so you know, what, what, what you have tonight in, on the orange sheet is a revised set of motions that were originally in your council packet uh, under item 186. The only change in that motion from what you received previously is it references the town attorney's letter. The town attorney has gone through this whole zoning ordinance and has very diligently located about 15 very minor changes, which he's included in a letter. And this motion would include all of his changes as an amendment if you chose to approve this this evening. Uh, motion 187 includes all these maps except for the scenic map. Motion 188 is this scenic map right here. Um, what you have before you is two options. One is to refer this to the planning board and let them work on it for a while. Your other option is to take this as it is for now and adopt it. And then finally, um, I've created a new item, item number 204. And when the, towns, when the Zoning Ordinance Rewrite Committee rewrote the Zoning Ordinance, there was a decision made that to put actual fee amounts into the Zoning Ordinance didn't seem to make a lot of sense. It would be a lot easier for the Town Council to amend fees from time to time if they were listed in the fee schedule. So what I've done is I've just pulled out those last stray remaining fees and added those as a potential amendment to the fee schedule. So that would be a neutral amendment, pulling those fees out of the Zoning Ordinance putting them into the fee schedule. If you don't adopt that, what, is, what happens is you have a zoning ordinance that tells someone that they have to pay a fee if they want to amend the zoning ordinance, but they don't know how much the fee is. And that's it. Terrific. Are there any council? No. We'll do this later. Thank you very much. <coughs> I would like to thank Mike Hill for going through this with a fine tooth comb. That had to be one incredible experience. <laughs> <A lot of coffee. laughs> thank you. Is there anybody from the public who would like to address this issue? Sir, come right up. Good evening, Councillors. My name is Seth Sprague, and I'm here tonight to represent the Sprague Corporation. And uh, I wanted to say that uh, we've been following this uh, scenic overlay district for some time now. And uh, as I think we've stated in other correspondence up to this point, that uh, we really feel like uh, this is a, a case of overregulation, regulation of areas that are already regulated, and uh, and represents uh, a slew of uh, subjective and vague standards that are uh, uh, largely unworkable and, and 
really represent an insensitivity to uh, private property owner rights. Um, so I understand that there are three different aspects of this that we're talking about, roads, views, and, and scenic areas. And I know that the working group has started uh, with very broad parameters and reduced uh, some of these to very specific things that seemingly don't have uh, uh, much teeth. But I, the uh, position of the Spread Corporation is that uh, really what you should do is just delete the whole, the whole shoot and match. Um, the roads, the way they've got it down now, is so that you're only dealing with the right of way. So you're not even dealing with regulating uh, private property. It's an in-town item at that point. Um, the views largely are views that are regulated by shoreland zoning and are views of property that are already undevelopable in, in most instances. And then when we get to the areas, we have this map here, which represents totally subjective uh, 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 pieces. And what has happened is that for some reason, uh, about a thousand acres of spread corporation property has been singled out. Uh, and although it's voluntary, we do have concerns that at some point in the future, uh, those uh, voluntary aspects of the plan may be uh, done away with. Um, um, so at the least, if you don't decide to delete uh, the scenic overlay district, we'd ask that you uh, uh, remove the Spread Corporation property from the plan because, in fact, the Spread Corporation property is already uh, under uh, review from the planning board as we have subdivided the property and uh, has all the uh, necessary uh, uh, powers already to regulate the property without adding a whole nother layer of uh, bureaucracy to the uh, proceeding. Thank you. Thank you very much. Who would like to be next? Please come to the microphone. <coughs> Hi, my name is Jeanette Hagen. I'm here to address the scenic aspect of the proposed ordinance. I've been here before and I'll be brief. I wrote you at the end of April and I um, hope that I clearly outlined the concerns of this break corporation which Seth has articulated again. I'd just like to, I'm um, speaking really now for myself. I believe in preservation of land and open space. I've been a member of the Conservation Commission. I'm currently a member of the Land Trust and I'm a member of the board of the Maine Audubon. I simply don't believe that adopting the scenic aspect of this ordinance is the proper vehicle to meet the objectives of preservation of land. And I have to tell you, I take absolutely no comfort in the fact that this is voluntary in terms of the scenic areas. Because it may be all well and good while you're here and you understand the balance of private and property, private and public, but we could have a less sensitive town council and end up with a very diff different situation. To me, what is being proposed here is legislation of private land into the public domain, and I just think that that's wrong. If you want to preserve property in this town, support your conservation commission, support your land trust. They're able to take, it, take in land and fee, either through sales or gifting, and that's the proper vehicle to do this. And I would just like to say I, I appreciate Rosemary Reed, Bill Jordan, and Bill Linnell's position on this and would hope that the other counselors would seriously consider um, deleting the scenic overlay district. I, I just have to say um, that this map I find appalling. I think that the lines are amorphic. There's no way to determine how many acres are covered. I would point to section eight, which is, I guess, minimal or medium interest that that those are private views you'd have to trespass to see those views um, so I have I those are my concerns and I hope that you will think this through clearly before you adopt this at scenic aspect of the ordinance thank you anybody else please come to the microphone yes, sir Uh, Jim Murray, uh, am I correct in reading this that on the westerly side of 77 there's a 10,000 square foot minimum and on the easterly side uh, 
There's an 80,000? That is the proposal the same, sir. Right now, it is all 80,000. Okay, but don't you come to the landowners and recommend or suggest or, or mention to them that you're going to do something like that? This has Nobody gone. has approached me, and I assume I'm in that situation. I don't believe could be wrong, your but, uh, property is being, there's no change being proposed for your property, sir. But my property is 80,000 square foot for minimum lot size, and across the street is 10,000. Is that correct? That's the proposal this evening. Yeah. I'd, I'd like to see a table that until I have a chance to discuss it with Maureen or somebody. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Who else would like to speak to this this evening? Please come to the microphone. Hi, my name is Martha Porch, and my husband and I own the Lobster Shack. We're really concerned about um, the scenic overlay district. I had the same concerns as the Spray Corporation. Uh, we're regulated to death. We're regulated as to how close we can be to the ocean, how much we can uh, change any kind of a building. The regulations are incredible. And I'm concerned about, even though it's voluntary, when will it not be voluntary? And I hope that uh, you delete it from your ordinance. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else? Yes, sir. My name is Finn Sprite, and I'm here to, to talk to you a moment about the scenic overlay. Um, in 1972, I was working for the Maine Geological Survey, and they did, they were doing a critical areas study, and basically they covered the entire state, and they were listing all of the sites in the state of any importance, or anybody's importance, and we've been working a long time on this scenic overlay, and ideas tend to generate and snowball and they get larger and larger. And this one is a voluntary <coughs> ordinance. And next year, it'll be changed a little bit more and it will eventually become a major ordinance. I think that ideas like this should be stopped. I think that when you start to move down this slippery slope, there really is difficult to come back. Ideas like this are brought forth into the public forum for comments, for concepts, so that the public can speak out. And I think you're definitely on the wrong track on this. And I'd like to thank the counselors who are speaking up against it, because that's the only way we're going to have private ownership of land in the future. There are plenty of ordinances, and we don't need any more creep like this. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else? I'm Ann Schenk, and I'm responding in part <clears throat> as the chairman of the Scenic Working Group in terms of our original intent for this particular part of the proposal. Um, this is part of what the whole scope of the scenic protection provisions had been about, that some of it was designed to protect the broader areas and not simply those that were restricted to individual properties. And I'd like to show you, if I could, we're using the magic marker for a minute, um, what we were thinking. And in fact, rather than narrowing what you could do with a property, I think that our vision was that it would broaden it, if only in so far as giving the planning board in particular a better sense of how to consider the visual impacts of what was happening when something was undergoing development <clears throat> that would allow them to be more flexible with the natural provisions that are already provided in terms of lot size, clustering, and massing of structures on an individual property. And let me just show you briefly on the flip chart, if you would, what we were thinking. Um, I think what we were thinking is that traditionally, if you have an open a lot that's for development that looks vaguely you know, rectangular even, 
and there happens to be, say, a cluster of trees in the middle of it, that under the normal massing requirements or the, the traditional thing you do is divide it in four like this and, you know, cut down the trees so that you have access. I think our feeling was that if you considered this in terms of it, the scenic impact of the development as a whole, that it would allow you to make some concessions about how you drew the lot lines in order to cluster it. And I think if you'll notice in most of the other zoning provisions, it says, you know, massing those four structures in so that they are um, visually there's less impact, you know, if assuming that some of this is an open area, for example, that there's less impact on the, on the development as a whole so that there's improved visual uh, approach to the development so that it would be next to the trees and that you might have to make some accommodations, for example, in terms of the types, the way the lot lines are drawn or even the, the total square footage of the lots in order for you to take advantage of the fact that the visual impact of the property as a whole <clears throat> would be vastly improved if you made some accommodations for the fact that that was all by itself a really important value. Uh, not that you're going to over-regulate, but that you can use this as a tool um, to adapt and be flexible about whatever development that should take place on any given plot of land. Um, in fact, I think that the group felt strongly that this was an additional tool um, to strengthen the ability to be flexible in dealing with individual plots that have individual um, both um, topography or um, water, ponds, wetlands, um, that you could then be more flexible. I think it was a tool that we thought was part of a bigger um, issue around the transfer of development rights and, and the long gone concept of contract zoning where you really design a zone or any subdivision around the particular characteristics of a piece of property rather than looking at it as if all of Cape Liz was, was flat and rectangular. Um, so that was the thinking of the group rather than a way of further confining what could happen, but the, uh, the availability of using scenery, the scenic impact, as an additional tool for considering how a property is developed. Any Thank questions? you. Thank you very much. Who else would like to address this? Hi, I'm Carol Haas. I live on Loxley Road. Um, I was a member of the uh, scenic work group. Um, we got together many nights and talked this over, coming from very, very different perspectives. Um, my perspective is that the public has an interest in development that happens in town. The development that private property owners choose to do on their property has an effect on every other resident of this town. Um, we had a lot of interesting discussion, philosophical discussions on, on this group, in, this, in, a, in the work group as to whether you had the right to really regulate what the private property owner could do on their property. Um, we ended up in the ordinance not making requirements, not regulating what the private property owner could do as far as development. But I view the, um, the, the, the work that we did as an acknowledgement that the public has an interest in how the town is developed, that what private property owners do with their property affects the people who are driving past their property, who look at their property, and to whom their property has an importance. Um, it's merely a request that the public interests and concerns be considered when development is planned for an area. It's not a demand. It's not a regulation. It's an acknowledgment of the public interest, and it's an acknowledgment of public concern, and it's a request that the public be considered. Thanks. Thank you. Yes, sir. 
Hello, my name is John Green. I also uh, was a member of the working group to study the scenic aspect. Also a member of the Zork uh, for the two and a half year time frame that we went over all of this. I would like to, um, my opinion in the working group, uh, in when we came to consensus, there obviously was, obviously was disparate opinion uh, on one end, other people on the other. Um, uh, we did come to one uh, important, uh, perhaps, agreement um, outside of our own opinions, uh, mine being of, of the mindset of not uh, preferring the scenic ordinance uh, at all. But if you, if you read the letter from our working group, the charge to the council, um, I think that really states one of the most important points that we came up with. And that was the scenic working group believes that the town council uh, bears an important responsibility moving forward with the scenic protection agenda. We ask that the council identify a committee to encourage public efforts to collaborate, collaborate with private entities to develop a long-term protection plan that incorporates conservation easements, uh, and to outright gifts, partnership efforts with land trusts, public acquisition from town funds, or bond issues. And I feel perhaps that is the most important way to preserve any scenic aspect in this town is not through regulation of private property, perhaps, but through efforts such as purchase of property through easements, or as is mentioned here. So I feel from, from my perspective, uh, even though we came from different opinions, uh, we came to a consensus, I still feel this is probably the most important aspect out of our group is that let's not regulate, let's, uh, let's actually purchase these properties if, if uh, the public wants the view. Thank you. Thank you. Who else would like to speak? And remember, the discussion is not limited to this component of the ordinance. If there's any other component anybody else would like to address. <coughs> All right, seeing none, we'll close the public hearing. I'd like to hear from the council. What are your wishes? Councilor Reid? Uh, would you like me to make my motion for discussion? Certainly. Uh, Madam Chairman, I move that we delete um, 19610 and 1984 and appendix, uh, map appendix A from the final council draft of the zoning ordinance dated May 5th, 1997. Second. Discussion on this, please. Councilor Coxell. I would like um, Councillor Reed to please explain her reasons for eliminating the entire section, including the scenic road overlay in particular. Philosophically, I have been opposed to this since the beginning, and I have um, spoken of my concerns. Um, I think that it is easier at this point in time, and instead of wordsmithing, um, Tonight, all of the um, changes that if we delete reference to those sections and then they can be worked back. We've heard uh, reference to the fact that um, some of these can be amended. I think if some can um, withstand um, further scrutiny and are absolutely imperative to the town, they can be added back uh, without taking the scenic overlay district um, you know, to the degree that it is right now. Would Council you Council? please repeat the sections that you... Uh, 19610, 1984, and Appendix A. For the audience, that includes the Scenic Protection Overlay Districts, the Scenic Protection Performance Standards, and the map. It's on the board this evening. Councilor Jordan. No, excuse me. I agree with the motion, and uh, I'll vote in favor of the motion. And uh, the reason I'm in favor, I think it's going too far. I thought people own land and what have you, and nowadays it seems that my neighbors tell me what my land will do and what I will do, and I don't think that's a proper use. Of, uh, of your land. And uh, I know there's certain scenic areas within the town that uh, are good to, for people to ride by and look at, but I think the landowner should have a little something to say about what he does in the future. 
And as I read this, and if it's adopted, I think in the future, anybody with any land, but some people feel has seen it, is down the drain, and they don't seem to want to, to buy the land and own it themselves and look at it. They want somebody else to do it. So I'm very much against it. Thank you. Councilor McGinty. I also have a lot of difficulty of uh, trying to dictate to private landowners exactly what they can do with their property. I agree there's a lot of regulation as it is now. Um, however, um, I would like to see us work on this further. I, I think that um, basically what John Green said, I think that compromise and, and working with landowners um, in a voluntary way or through the planning board or the planning process or some, some way. Um, I don't want to see this issue die completely. Um, I can't support it. I mean, I support the motion. I can't support the sections tonight. Um, but I would like to see us continue to work on it in some way. And if it means the purchase of the property, then that's the direction we'll have to go in. Um, but I, I, I will be supporting uh, Councilor Reed's motion. Thank you. Councilor Coxell. Um, I just want to remind everyone that this was not something the committee did on its own, that it was a charge given to us by the council. It was part of recommendation from the comprehensive plan and that the state um, mandated us to also enact ordinances to um, complement the comprehensive plan. I also want to refer once again to the photos on the board over there that show um, two lights area down around um, the Lobster Shack area that also shows the present town poor farm land and it also shows what was known as the causeway which is a beautiful road with a canopy of trees that's very picturesque and sort of winds through the countryside that is now part of our route 77 that goes um, by Bari Beach Road so I would like to make a motion that we at least keep the scenic road information in the ordinance as it was, has been presented. Um, because if we don't, even though it is supposedly under the town's purview, there have been instances in the past, in fact, very recently, of ditch work being done and drainage ditches to be dug, and several trees were going to be cut. There were a number of citizens who protested, and thanks to the flexibility and imagination of our public works director, um, they were able to devise ways of retaining the trees and protecting them in the future from plows and from <coughs> runoff. Um, there again, they say that the ordinances are only as, as good as the counselors who decide upon them but they also have to keep in mind that unless there are certain guidelines, even town staff can make disastrous decisions. So I move that we retain the section on the um, scenic roads that are in the ordinance just as sort of a guideline for future decisions. Is that in the form of an amendment to the original motion? Yes. Is there a second to the amendment? Which is under 19.6. 10 um, under A, subsection 1, and related comments to those roads. Are there, is there the standard section, 1984C, included? Correct. Okay. I'm sorry, I didn't oh. 1984C, the performance standards for scenic roads. I will second the motion for discussion. Councillor Jordan? I would like to have somebody, I come off and left mine home, of those scenic roads that are being proposed to be in this uh, dock, people, as I understand it. I'm sorry, I didn't. Scenic views that are being proposed. I left mine home, I guess, and I would like if anybody had it, read them. Okay. 
so the people out here realize what Maureen, do you have that in term? What are, are we talking about views or roads? Councilor Jordan's talking about views. She's talking about views. Mm -hmm. Well, I, roads? I we think the both. views will tie the road because well, you got to ride or walk the road in order to see the view. Um, let's talk about the views. Then we'll get back to the amendment. Okay. Views. Do you want to? Yeah, you've you've got three scenic overlay districts, and and it'll help your discussion if you can, if you want to separate things out. If you try to think of them as three different, three discrete sections, the scenic views are listed starting on page 105, and I can I can show you the areas. But if you look at the bottom, um, you start with the the northern part of town, which I think of as the northern part of town, up here by Seaview Avenue. Um, if you look, there's a piece of uh, property that the town owns. It's a town beach. And the view is standing on Seaview Avenue and looking over the town property. Uh, the second view is the view of Pond Cove from Shore Road. And again, it's, it's as you drive or stand, mostly drive, on Shore Road, that section where, Pond, where Shore Road opens up to the ocean. So that, that is extending over private property. All of the private property extending over it is in the Resource Protection 3 floodplain district or in the shoreland zone. Third view is the view towards Portland Headlight from Trundy Point. Um, that is a view that extends off of Oak Knoll Road, and that view is, extends over a piece of property which is under a conservation easement, and it's uh, not going to be built on. I've had a visit from one of the people who actually is one of the four people who has the conservation easement. The next view is awful, also off, excuse me, also off, also off of Trundy Point, and it's the actual Trundy Point, and again, the view is off of Reef Road, and this is the land that was the subject of uh, one of the landmark town law cases in uh, the 1970s. Uh, the next one is the view toward two lights from Hannaford Cove, and again, this is when you head down Hannaford Cove Road and you go all the way to the end of Hannaford Cove Road, where it turns into a private road. If you stop just before, it, it goes to the right and you end up on Cutter Lane. There's a somewhat panoramic view of Staples Cove and the water there. And almost all of that view is on private property. Uh, almost all of that land is in floodplain or in shoreland zoning. There is one section of it that is on buildable property, and there has been a a uh, lot approved there, and there's the, the area of the view is not the area where the building will be placed, so it doesn't constrict that lot from development. Uh, the next one is the view of the Atlantic Ocean from Two Lights, and this is if you go all the way down to the end of Two Lights Road. Uh, it's looking over the U.S. Coast Guard property. Uh, after that, we have a view of Kettle Cove from Ocean House Road, view number W4, which extends, if you look, if you, as you head down Ocean House Road, as you look to the west, across the, the Crescent Beach State Park and you look to the south down Ocean House Road, it's kind of a, a 90 degree view. And then as you continue down, as you go back up to Bowery Beach Road, you drive down Bowery Beach Road, um, there's an open field just before you get to the Inn by the Sea. That is another view that's being protected. Uh, the next one we're talking about is the Fowler Road view of, pond, of Great Pond. And other than the the access that the town and the land trust have jointly created off of Bowery Beach Road. The only view you have of Great Pond from a public place is basically that view off of Fowler Road. Then if we go all the way over to the Spurwink Marsh, there's a series of views of the Spurwink Marsh. Probably one of the most prominent ones is the view over uh, Mr. Olson's property, starting on Wells Road, Councilor Jordan's property, and the Layton's property, and it extends in this direction right here, and it's a view over those three properties down to the marsh. There's another view that cuts down the bottom here, um, south of Wainwright Drive, and obviously most of that is in wetland area. There's a view that extends from the Spurwing Church, looking northwest. And that, again, is most of that is wetland, shoreland zoning, and town-owned property. There are two views that are on the Bowery Beach Road just before you hit the property, the uh, town boundary with Scarborough. And both of those are in <coughs> wetland and shoreland zoning. I think I've hit all of them. There might be one more view off of Wells Road, which again is Sawyer Road, Wells Road, that, that, that narrow area just before you head south in Sawyer Road before you cross into Scarborough. There's another view, and all of that is in wetland shoreland zoning. 
Thank you very much. Councilor, Jor Councilor Jordan, do you have any further questions about the views? No, I'll, I'll stand for now. Okay. I'll stand for now. Thank you, sir. <coughs> Councilor Groff. I, I just want to make sure I understand uh, what Councilor Coggeshall's uh, amendment was. Okay. And that is to delete, if I understand it correctly, it, it would be to go along with deleting 19.610 and 19.84C with the exception of exactly what paragraphs? That's what I was saying. 19.610 to retain um, the purpose statement and subsection 1, scenic protection 1, scenic roads overlay district. So all that would be left is on page 105, lines 1 through 17, and the rest of the entire 19.610 and 19.19-8-4C would be gone. Is that your amendment? I'm going to have to ask Maureen to double check, make sure I'm not missing something. I just want to make That's sure I know right. what I'm voting what, for. What I'm doing is um, Rosemary wanted to delete everything, all three areas and the references and the performance standards, and I was trying to retain the scenic road protection and related paragraphs in 1984. I believe that was C. Does that work? Yeah, you need you to do a little revision to the you, purpose. You statement. would need, yeah, you would need to keep on page 105, if you just wanted to keep the scenic roads, which is not what I just right. described, um, you'd need to keep uh, basically subsection one. So again, we'd probably keep the purpose statement amended slightly to reflect that just one district and keep one where it talks about where the scenic road overlay district is. I mean, and then if you want to keep the standards, you would have to keep page 175 I believe is where that starts um, you'd need to start on page 174 with the purpose statement with the flexibility right, right but you want to keep subsection C a, B, which is the standards I believe if you keep those standards those standards refer you to having to get a permit if you do certain things so you need to keep section E which has the permit procedures and then if you're going to have a permit and procedures, you need to have a standard to decide when you're going to issue that permit, and the standard is in Section F. So you'd need to keep Section 19.610.1, which has the list of what the scenic roads are. And then in Section 19.84, you'd need C, E, and F. What page is that, Maureen? Um, this 19.610 is in the 105 section, page 105 area. And then when you're talking about the scenic road standard, you're talk starting on page 175. Thank you. Plus 1984, um, somewhat modified A and B. Correct. Okay. These, these are not easily, they're, they're not dropped in. Some sections are dropped in and easily pulled out. Some of them, you need to go in and massage them a little because they're interrelated. Mm -hmm. Councilor Graff? But just so I understand from an, as an overview, what's left if in fact we kept in just the scenic, ro scenic roads overlay district is we're only talking about the right away of the road itself nothing past the right away so we're really only talking about regulating the town or am i missing something except there is a buffer. If, if you own property and you're going to the planning board for subdivision or site plan review, there's a requirement for a 30 foot wide vegetated buffer that extends from the right of way. And that's at the bottom of page 175. But that only, that only applies when you are before the planning board for subdivision or site plan review. So in all other cases, yes, you're within the right of way. But, and so then I, if I understand this correctly, we would be imposing a whole series of regulations on the town when in fact the town without these regulations, the town council could have that road construction within the right of way to basically comply with all this voluntarily whether it's in this amendment or not. It's just what, what we're trying to do is keep future councils from uh, not doing certain things concerning public roads? Is that the intent of this? 
if if I if I can ask the council your indulgence, uh, what I'd like to do is ask the chair of the scenic working group to come forward because that group was very strong in their belief and why we needed to have this, and I think they're a lot more eloquent than I am. I think part of the difficulty is that we're kind of working backwards, um, and I. If I can start at the beginning, <laughs> I'd like to think that we're talking about a general purpose statement about the value of scenic protection, first off. Then we're talking about roads, views, and areas. If you talk about the roads by themselves, we are talking about regulating and making strong statements that we think that there are some scenic protection things that should take place around roads. And yes, we're talking mostly entirely about regulating what happens um, with public works, except for any new subdivision, in which case there, when there's an impact on those roads, then in fact you're talking about something else. But it eliminates pretty much the requirement um, on anyone other than public works. If you work backwards from roads, if you talk about roads and areas, for example, I mean views, the views are all on public land pretty much are available from public land, they may go over a private land. But when we re redrew those boundaries on the views, there was no impact on private landowners. And that was part of the reason we drew them the way we did. You all set? Is that any, any clearer? Great. I was wondering if Maureen could name the um, scenic roads that we're speaking of there's been a change in that, I think, and also for the public to know. Certainly. Uh, there were originally, I believe, four scenic roads proposed, and the, the scenic working group uh, felt that um, if it was such a good idea, then we ought to stick more closely to the visual assessment study and go with uh, a more complete list of roads um, in an effort to be more consistent without making up a lot of new stuff. What they decided to do is, is use the classification of roads that we currently have in the ordinance and to apply to all collector roads and all rural connector roads the scenic designation. And if you look in the visual assessment study and you look at the list under those two categories, they match pretty well. And those roads are Mitchell Road, Scott Dyer Road, Shore Road, and then under the Rural Connector classification, Charles E. Jordan Road, Fowler Road, south of Bowery <coughs> Beach Road, Old Ocean House Road, Sawyer Road, Spurwink Avenue, Two Lights Road from Wheeler Road to Beacon Lane, and Wells Road. Just so just for a clarification, if this provision were uh, to stay in, when the reconstruction of Wells Road and the reconstruction of uh, Fowler Road are completed, have we estimated what the costs will be, uh, Mr. Malley or Michael may know, um, based on this ordinance? And does this present a problem in terms of the funding? It depends on what the extent of the construction is on those roads. If, if all you're talking about is reconstruction of the roadway, if the traveled way is essentially going to stay the same and the, the shoulders are st essentially going to stay the same, you do not need a permit from the planning board. If you are increasing the width of the pavement, if you're creating shoulders where there were no shoulders before, if you're making major changes in horizontal or vertical alignment, then that would be considered something that would need planning board review. Okay, so I asked the question to the town manager then, since this town council has suggested that um, paved shoulders be added um, for new construction of roadways, did the estimate include provisions to match up to this ordinance language? No. Thank you. I, I won't be supporting the amendment. Any further discussion about the scenic roads? amendment as proposed. Council Council. I just want to apologize to the public for seem, seeming to be so disjointed tonight, but um, the actual abolition of all of the scenic ordinances came as a bit of a surprise. That's why we're so disorganized and not as efficient as we often are. It's been, yeah, let's do this part first. 
I generally favor the scenic protection overlay districts. I do that because I believe that is, as it has been drafted now by the um, working group, we have an instrument that's a very useful planning instrument. It allows flexibility. It allows us to deal with unique situations. It does not tie the hands. It is a voluntary proposal. I do take a bit of exception with some of the um, comments that I've heard this evening about basically not being able to trust future councils. The membership of the council is not in my hands by any means. It's not in the hands of anybody sitting up here tonight. It's in the hands of those of you who go to the polls and vote. And what I'm hearing is almost a, a fear situation that, yes, you can trust these seven maybe, but you know, the next council or a council five years down the road, maybe you can't trust. I do have to take some exception to that kind of statement. Um, again, I find it a reasonable planning tool. I will be supporting the amendment. I will not be supporting the main motion. Any further discussion on the amendment? <coughs> Councilor McGinty? Just to clarify for myself and hopefully for the public, and maybe Maureen can answer this, the scenic roads provision still has an impact on private property owners. There's a 30-foot buffer if there's site plan review or subdivision review. Right. Thank you. Anybody else? All right. The vote at this point is on the amendment to the main motion. This would leave in the provisions dealing with scenic roads. All those in favor of the amendment? I would like to clarify okay. again exact that, that motion. I don't understand that motion because unless it's set out exactly, I'm still not clear. And unless it is clear, I certainly will vote against it as exactly what lines in this red book you're saying would remain. Uh, that's just too ambiguous for me to even okay. to consider voting on that. After Maureen's explanation, with um, it would be section A. I'm in two different sections here. You want to give the page number for page 105. Can we stop there for a minute? I, I don't see how that can be because section A says that there's three scenic protection overlay districts are designated well, and I haven't finished explaining. Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry. The purpose would be reworked to just include only the roads and we'd retain number one scenic protection one. So, as you said before, it's lines 1 through 17 with the reference only to the scenic roads. And you go to page 175. Start with page 174, please. 174, the scenic protection performance standards. It would be purpose A, which would also just only refer to the scenic roads um, applicability, I assume, Maureen. Then on to C on 175. Scenic Road Standards, and it would be that entire page. She said that, as you mentioned, the landscape buffer strips. It would be section... Section E. Section E, Scenic Resource Permit Procedures on page 177, and it would be section F on page 178 that talks about the permit standards for approval. Okay. And my problem, and I'm just so we understand, I can't vote for that because the language doesn't consistently match the intent, and I don't think that's a way to uh, approve or disprove anything where I'm counting on somebody else to eventually clean up language. And I, I can't do something procedurally that way. And for that reason, I mean, I would have to vote against that. Any further clarification or discussion on the amendment? All those in favor of the amendment? All those opposed? Two to five with Linnell, McGinty, Groff, Reed, and Jordan. Back to discussion on the main motion. Is there any further clarification or discussion on the main motion, which is to totally delete the scenic overlay provisions? Councilor Linnell? Thank you, Madam Chairman. 
uh, I'm supporting the motion. I think uh, uh, it would be prudent to take the uh, language out for now. I don't think it's sensitive enough to uh, private property owners. I think it would be uh, more appropriate to uh, go back to the drawing board and identify some of the priorities and work through gifts and uh, if and, and when we identify those priorities or when they are identified to uh, look at gifts uh, and consider purchasing conservation easements over that property. You don't necessarily have to buy the whole piece of property, but we, uh, if there's something that, the, that we agree our, our views and that are near and dear to our hearts, uh, we should uh, not essentially take them. We should uh, uh, strike a deal with a landowner. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? I'd like to thank Mr. Green for reminding the Council about the Scenic Working Group's recommendation um, to form a committee to look at uh, those aspects of land preservation. That, honestly, John, was one thing I had flagged before tonight. So. But it's nice to play off a comment from the audience. I would recommend that the Council set up a work an, up for an upcoming workshop topic to identify the composition and a charge to such a committee. Um, I guess that's enough said. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Mm -hmm. Oh, excuse me. Yeah. Sir. Um, maybe I shouldn't in the clock. If you're going to butt, you need yeah. to do so publicly. <laughs> to follow up on uh, Council. Would you please introduce yourself? I'm sorry, I'm Mark Ironman from Planning Decisions. Uh, to fo follow up on Councilor Groff's comment, um, I think the proposal before you still creates some orphans that you may also want to include in the motion. Um, and there are some other references to the scenic overlay districts that are in the ordinance that I think uh, you should, if you're going to vote on deleting those two sections also get rid of the other references. Um, and I'm working from an old version and a new version, so bear with me a, a second. On page 18. Mark, excuse me. Do you think it w if it works, if we have a general um, addition to the motion to delete all refer references? That's, that's fine. I was just going to Councillor Groff's concern about just do that. Um, people understanding. There are three or four other places where there are references that should be deleted if you are, in fact, going to. Uh, consider a motion or a vote on deleting those. Right. Thank you for making us aware of that. Um, would the maker of the motion like to include that? Most certainly. And whoever seconded it? All right. Thank you. Somebody who's very well acquainted with the ordinance language in front of us. Anything further? All right. All those in favor of the main motion? All those opposed? Thank you. The vote is 5 to 2 with Cogsville and McLaughlin opposed. Council Council. Yes, I'd like to make a motion. Mm -hmm. Be it ordered the Cape Elizabeth Town Council does hereby adopt a new Chapter 19 zoning ordinance of the revised Code of Ordinances, specifically adopting that draft dated May 5, 1997, as amended by the town attorney in his letter dated May 1, 1997, and as amended by the previous motion having held public hearings on March 12, 1997 and May 5, 1997 with proper notice giving, having been provided in accordance with 30A MRSA Section 4352. The Town Council also wishes to thank the Zoning Ordinance Rewrite Committee, the Planning Board, the Scenic Provisions Working Group, the Comprehensive Planning Committee, the Affordable Housing Study Committee, the Conservation Commission, the Zoning Board of Appeals, the Visual Access Working Group, the Pedals and Pedestrians Committee, and all other towns and boards and committees whose contributions have led to the adoption of this new ordinance. We wish also to especially thank Town Planner Maureen O'Mara, Mark Ariman of Planning Decisions, and Evett Rickert, formerly of Market Decisions, for their invaluable assistance throughout the process. Second. Thank you. Discussion? I would like to propose an amendment 
that in section 19-6-4, the town center district, TC, under the space and bulk standards, uh, D sub 2, that the minimum lot area for a single family dwelling unit in the town center core subdistrict be established at 10,000 square feet. And under standard number E, letter E, site plan review, construction involving any permitted use other than farming in a single family dwelling except that construction of or conversion to a single family dwelling in the town center core subdistrict shall be subject to site plan review by the planning board. Madam Chair. Sir, there's no discussion unless we have a second. I didn't hear what you said. said. There will be no discussion unless there's a second to the motion. Second. Okay. Council O'Neill. Yeah, I, I would like to, uh, uh, I'd table this until we have a chance to uh, talk to Jim Murray about his concerns about the lot size. Uh, All those in favor of, is that a motion, sir? Yeah. Just this, I mean, just this. We need to get a second for your motion. Just this amendment. Councillor Jordan. Are we tabling your amendment? Are we a tabling the whole motion which Councillor Cogeshall started out with? That was a table to the amendment. Table to the amendment. Yes, sir. Thank you. My, my intent is just to table this amendment talking about the lot size. Okay, we need a second for the table. I'd, I'd second that. The table. We're just right. ta tabling table the, the, amendment. the amendment. All right. There is no dis I'm s I, I misspoke. There is no discussion of a tabling motion. All those in favor of the tabling motion to table the amendment that was proposed. All those in favor of tabling. One, two, three. All those opposed to tabling. Four. Cogsill, McLaughlin, Groff, and Reed. Councilor uh, Reed. Um, Madam Chairman, is there some sort of uh, Roberts rule that says if you're on the prevailing side, you can ask a question about that since we couldn't discuss it before the vote? <laughs> you can discuss the motion. The reason that I don't think it's appropriate to table is because Mr. Murray's property is not impacted by this amendment. Am I correct? Yes, you are. Okay. Thank you. Discussion of the proposed amendment. Councilor Groff. If I understand the proposed amendment, in the Red Book currently, mm -hmm. it's already 80,000 square foot on, the, on the, this side of the street, the town hall's side of the street. And in the Red Book right now is 20,000 square foot uh, on the other side in the little sub-district. And all the recommendation is, is within the little sub-district, to not have it be 20,000, but to have it be 10,000. Do I understand that correctly? That is correct. So that wouldn't have any impact whatsoever. Uh, this amendment has no impact whatsoever on anybody except the small number of homes in the little sub-district on the right side of the road here where the lot size could be 10,000 and not 20,000. And that's all this does compared to what's in the Red Book, correct? It does that, plus require that single family um, Houses be subject to site plan review. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Council and now. Yeah, the reason for my vote is, you know, I just think it. it uh, Jim Murray has a an issue with a with a fairness. Why, uh, why should it be uh, eighty thousand on one side of the road and ten thousand on the other side? That's the reason for my vote. Okay, thank you. Appreciate that, Council Council. I think there needs to be a clarification. It's the formation of any new lot anywhere. It doesn't make existing lots non-conforming. They're still legal lots. It's just the formation of a new lot. Thank you. Councilor Jordan. My problem with the deal is 1A is the 80,000 square feet. 1B, single family dwelling unit in the town center core subdivision was originally 20,000 square feet, but we can change that to 10, but we can't change the 80. That's where I get confused. We can change one, but we can't change the other. 
Councillor Jordan, my understanding is if you had want, you can change things. If you had wanted to change the 80 overall to 20 or 10 or whatever, that needed to be part of what was set to public hearing. So Sorry. 20 was set to public hearing or 10? 20 was set to public hearing. Okay. You cannot make a substantive change at public hearing from what was set to public hearing. This has been referred to the town attorney. The determination is that a change, the proposed change was 80 to 20. A change from 80 to 10 is not a substantive change over 80 to 20. Did I get that? 10 to 20. I, di I didn't recommend go from 80 to 20. I didn't put any number on it. But if you're cutting a law from half, if you're going from 20 to 10, by my numbers, that's half. And it seems so that would be substantial. It was going from 80 to 20 or 80 to 10, not from 20 to 10 necessarily. 1B is down here as 20. Mm -hmm. And we crossed out 20 and put down 10. That's what I'm talking about. Thank you. And to me, that's half. Now, maybe it isn't half, but I figure it is half. <laughs> and I didn't propose anything for 80. I could almost do it and say it should be 40, and you're cutting it in half the same as you're doing the second one. Right now, 1B is 80, as things stand in the current zoning ordinance. I believe. Councilor McGinty? I had a question regarding the site plan review. <coughs> Why in the rest of the town center site plan review is not required for a single uh, dwelling, single family dwelling, but you want it site plan review? I was taking board. that, yes, from a recommendation from the planning board, and I'd ask the planner to address that for us, please. Um, I believe it was uh, in March that the council asked the planning board to provide their advice on a proposal to reduce that area's uh, minimum lot size for single family dwellings from 80,000 square feet to 20,000 square feet. Uh, the planning board met on April 1st at a workshop and they discussed this and it was their feeling, they, their feeling was uh, one, that they were concerned about making this kind of a change without a comprehensive look at the entire zone. Um, absent the time or the willingness to take a comprehensive look at the entire zone, uh, they then looked at the whole theory and concept behind the town center district. They noted that residential uses tend to be ringed around a village as opposed to right in the middle of the center. Um, but if this was going to be proposed, they felt that a minimum lot size of 10,000 square feet much more closely reflected the compactness of a typical village, that 20,000 square feet is a suburban lot size. And in fact, there are two residential zones in the town of Cape Elizabeth, the RA district and the RC district. The RA district has an 80,000 minimum lot size. The RC district has a 20,000 minimum lot size. And the feeling of the board was that that you needed 10 to really get the kind of density that you should have in a village. But at the same time, once you start making things much more compact, small errors or poor decisions in the design of a site have major consequences. Therefore, they felt that if you're building a single family home in the center of town on a small lot, it was, it was much more important that there be site plan review. And if the, if the council will keep in mind that the town center district is the only district that we have that has those illustrated design guidelines, so that those guidelines that you have in here are the kind of things that would be applied to a single family structure. You would be able to look very carefully at, in, that, at access uh, to make sure curb cuts are appropriately sited, that buildings are facing the street instead of backing up to the street, that houses have uh, front doors that face onto the street, that they have porches and windows and all the kind of things that hopefully would make the town center a more pedestrian inviting area. That was generally what the board was thinking of when they made that recommendation. Thank you. Oh, that, thank you. <coughs> Further discussion? The vote will be only on the amendment. What's the amendment? The amendment 
again is for section 1964 town center district tc d standards 1b single family dwelling unit in the town center core subdistrict to be 10,000 square feet for the standards e site plan review construction involving any permitted use other than farming in a single family dwelling except the construction of or conversion to a single family dwelling in the town center core subdistrict shall be subject to site review by the planning board Council Council. Yes, I will not be supporting the amendment because it came as a recommendation from a workshop of the planning board. They were under pressure to make some sort of response. It was not a full-fledged um, recommendation. It was a suggestion. And therefore, I can't support the 10,000 square foot size. Council McGinty. I also will not be supporting the reduction from 20,000 to 10,000. I do support the 20,000. Council Linnell? I think I'm going to uh, reluctantly support the amendment. I think 10,000 is, is a good idea. I, uh, I, I, do, I just note that it's a little lopsided to have 10,000 on one side of the road and 80,000 on the other. But uh, I think it's a step in the right direction. All those in favor of the amendment? All those opposed? Four to three with McGinty, Cogswell, and Jordan opposed. Discussion on the main motion. Councilor Groff. Hadn't we discussed earlier of also including the uh, attorney's um, clarifications? That was part of the motion. She read the motion off. Okay. The revised. I'm, I'm sorry. But that doesn't. Okay. The uh, town. Attorney letter dated May 1st. Right. right. It was Thank including you. Including that, it was also including the previously um, approved amendment to delete the scenic overlay districts. Okay. Right. I'm going to ask the clerk for a roll call vote, please. All those in. Whatever you do. <laughs> All those. Council Cogsall? Yes. Council Groff? Yes. Council Jordan? No. Council or Linnell? I need a clarification. I've sort of lost my place here. So we're on the, <laughs> Council, we're on the main motion. It's right there. No. Councilor McGinty? No. Councilor Reed? Yes. Chairman McLaughlin? Yes. The main motion as amended passes four yeas, three nays. Thank you very much. <coughs> that was item number 186. We also have item 187, which is consideration of adoption of the proposed official zoning map and other maps. Council Cogsell. Be it ordered the Cape Elizabeth Town Council does hereby adopt as the official zoning map for the town of Cape Elizabeth the zoning map dated May 5, 1997, as well as the Great Pond Watershed map, the TDR map, as prepared by the Greater Portland Council of Governments. We also wish to thank Chris Sommer at the Greater Portland Council of Governments for her assistance in preparing these maps. Do we have a second? I'll second it for purposes of discussion. Also because it's quite meaningless to have a zoning ordinance without the accompanying zoning maps. Councilor McGinty. Um, hold on a second, let me check some. Madam Chair? Yes, sir. My, my question was regarding 1984 and specifically transfer of development rights. And mm -hmm. Maybe Mark can help us out on this one. It, didn't we eliminate that section? If we did eliminate this section, do we still need a TDR map? I 
don't recollect the elimination of that well, it's section. Well, par it's part of 1984. It can be used. It's referenced. Just a re that's just a reference? Can you tell me what page you're on, please? I'm in the index. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> there's no, no you page. There's no page numbers. Is boring. That was a reference. That's 1973 is a transfer. Page 177. Okay, then that was just a reference. It was mm -hmm. referencing that. All right, fine. Okay. Any further discussion about the maps? As I said in my second, it's quite meaningless to have a zoning ordinance without the accompanying maps. I will certainly be supporting the motion. All those in favor of the motion? All those opposed? 7-0. Item number 188 is moot. We will not be dealing with that. It is deleted. I would entertain taking an item out of order, if anybody so wants to make that motion. Councilor Cogsell. Madam Chairman, I make a motion that we take an item out of order, number 204. Is that what you want? Amendment to the town fee schedule. First of all, we need to... We need first to um, vote on taking it out of order. Is there a second to the no motion? Thank you, Councillor Jordan. All those in favor of taking an item out of order? All those opposed? 7-0. Councillor Cogsell? Yes, um, Madam Chairman, I move we take item 204, an amendment to the town fee <coughs> schedule. Um, these were fees that were found in the zoning ordinance, which are very difficult to change as we need to, and we now have an actual existing fee schedule. So I'm moving that we um, hereby amend the town fee schedule to add the following fees, which were previously listed in the zoning ordinance. Building permit late fee, $35. Building permit penalty fee, $50. Zoning ordinance change map or text, $100. Second. Thank you. Comment, discussion? All those in favor? All those opposed? 7-0. Thank you. Item number 189 is also a planning issue, Mr. McGovern. Yes, the town council received a letter from uh, Herbert Strout asking you to look into the issue of the siting of communication towers within the, Cape, within the town of Cape Elizabeth. Since this would eventually constitute, if action was taken, an amendment to the new zoning ordinance, and since any amendment to the new zoning ordinance needs to be first uh, reviewed by the planning board prior to be acting, acted upon by the council, it's recommended that this item be referred to the planning board uh, with a request to the planning board to report back by the end of this calendar year. Thank you. Could, I, could we have a motion, please? So moved. Second. Thank you. Any discussion? All those in favor? Opposed? 7-0. Thank you. And that concludes zoning. That's yours. Thank you. Cleaning off my desk. We are going to have a public hearing and council discussion and council action on proposed general fund and special fund funds. Again, I would ask the council, as I did prior to the earlier public hearing of this evening, that any proposed revisions that councillors would like to make relative to the budget that has been placed on the agenda, they would make those so the public knows what they can be responding to. Again, the council is very open to the comments and the suggestions of the public, and we'll take those into account as you've already seen previously this evening, when it makes its motions and takes its vote. Is there any councillor who has a proposal for revisions to the budget at this time? Councillor McGinty, did you have something? You had a um, memo in the council packet. Uh. I would like to hear a uh, public uh, hearing before I make a motion. I'm not asking for a motion, sir. I'm asking for an explanation of your proposal so that the public will be aware of it. Which proposal is that, Madam Chair? I had a memo from you dated April 30th um, and April 28th 
attach my proposals for reductions in the budget. I would further reduce the tax increase through use of the undesignated surplus, and then there is a listing of proposed cuts. Those were not proposed cuts. That was a memo I made at the request of Councillor Groff. Um, I made it to all the councillors, so that in case Councillor Groff brought it up, they know what we're talking about. Um, as you know, this, uh, the, uh, the budget was moved forward uh, for a 52 cent tax increase. Um, with one no vote, mine, and uh, until I hear public comment or we have further discussion on the budget, um, I don't have a motion to make. Okay, again, I was not asking for a motion. I was asking for input from council so that the public knows what they're oh, would you, responding to. I, I, what would you like me to say? I, I, I propose the current budget. Now, that's all I have to say at this time. Okay, I misunderstood the intent of your um, memo then. I thought this was a proposal coming forth. I wanted the public to be able to address it if that was still a proposal coming forth. Any other revisions that counselors want to um, share with the public before they come to speak to us? All right, is there anybody from the public who would like to we go through it? Okay. Thank you. <laughs> um, Mr. Councillor McGinty, as chairman of the Finance Committee, could you introduce the item so the public will know what they're addressing during public hearing? Uh, this is a public hearing for the proposed general fund and the special funds budget. I think there's a — was there a copy of this for the — yeah, it was, yes, they get yeah, there is a copy in the back table for anybody who would like to review. There's a number of uh, special funds, and the uh, the numbers are all there for the uh, the general fund. Okay, we will assume then that the public has taken advantage of the materials that's, that have been put out on the back table this evening. Is there anybody who would like to address the council in public hearing on the proposed? any of the proposed budgets? If so, would you please come to the podium? Thank you. Hi, Beth Courier, School Board Chair, 18 Belfield Road. And I would just like to urge the Council to um, accept the school budget as it has been presented um, to you. We have gone through the process. We had a number of budget uh, workshops. We worked very hard on our budget to get where we were. We met with you. and. Um, I urge you to accept it as it is and that the process does work and that not to change things at the 11th hour on us. But thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else? Yes, sir. My, my name is Glenn Kirstein, 3 Avon Road. Um, I am accustomed to coming before you in my capacity as the town auditor, being a partner of Runyon Christine Millette. I'm here in casual clothes this <laughs> evening as a citizen. Um, I have not participated in the budgetary process. I come in here at the, at the 11th hour um, to say two things. First, uh, I fully support our school board. Do not take away any money from them. Um, my two daughters have now graduated. Um, every penny uh, that I invested in this community in its school system has paid off. The second thing is that I, I, I am here because um, I was asked if I'd be interested in if uh, the town had interest in taking money out of fund balance. Um, I come before the council annually and talk about the need to be conservative. Um, and I take you back 10 years when the town had a 4.5% fund balance compared to its budget. It has taken the town 10 years to increase that budget to almost where it should be. Um, in 1995, um, the fund balance stood at 7.5% of the total budget. Last year, if my recollection is correct, it slipped slightly to something like 7.3 percent. The rule of thumb um, that comes not from me but from Wall Street is that uh, fund balance should equal 
roughly 8.5% of the total budget. We're not there yet. It's slow going to increase your one's fund balance. We have accomplished that not only from um, prudent financial planning, but by the luck of our economy. Because six years ago, our tax collection rate was 5% less than it is today. It stands at something like 98.5%, which is one of the highest in the state. If that declines for any reason um, by 3%, it will have an, a material impact on our fund balance. As I came here this evening, I read a memo from, from Mike McGovern. Um, and I hate to take issue with some of the things that, that Michael has written. They, they come from, from per, two different perspectives. Um, attached to his memo, um, he has uh, Moody's credit report from 1994, in which it, it, it indicates that it is the, town's, the town strives to maintain approximately 10% of the tax levy and undesignated fund balance. And it was that statement, I believe, from which Michael's numbers were derived. As I sat in the audience, um, I did some recalculations um, based on the 8.5% rule of thumb. Um, and I, I can tell you that simply having, having taken $266,000 out of fund balance already, um, without take, and I am assuming that the, the existing uh, amounts included in the budget um, representing use of fund balance will be paid for by the profit that Mike and Scott are going to make this year. Um, Explain but, yourself. Ah. <laughs> Jeez. By, by the conservative budgeting in fiscal 1997. Jeez. Undead, uh, the additions to undesignated balance this year from efficiencies and cost savings. But if, if we started with $1,250,000 and took out 266000 during the current fiscal year, and we added nothing to fund balance. That means our fund balance is going to be at 5.4% um, of our total budget of $18 million. Um, that's woefully low. If we then take another $350,000 from that, we would be coming into the next fiscal year with a fund balance of only $634,000. And, and that um, results in a fund balance of something like 3.5% of our budget. And in the 10 years that I've been associated with the town, it has never been that low, and that's dangerous. Um, so I don't like to see tax increases any more than anyone else. Um, but I, I um, and if I was on the other side of the table, I would have a difficult decision to make myself. But I caution you. <coughs> Um, not to, to impact fund balance, at least in a material way. And if you do, then you should simultaneously have a plan to restore that fund balance to the recommended levels, um, be that over a, a two-year, three-year, four-year period. And that's, I guess, all I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you very much. Is there anybody else who'd like to address the budget? Yes, sir. See. My name is Henry Adams. I live at Todd Road. I would urge the council to adopt the school budget as presented and to adopt the town budget as presented. The town budget is down by four cents over last year, and the school budget is at 55 cents, and making a total of 52 cents increase in the tax rate. I don't think it is fair for the taxpayers of the town of Cape Elizabeth to... You want to just put that microphone straight? I think that gets rid of some of that. Is that better? 
or else it is. I don't think it's fair for the taxpayers of the town of Cape Elizabeth to uh, pay uh, for the school budget. In other words, the school budget stands on its own, and it's done a very good job, and the town budget stands on its own, and we've done a very good job. I think if you fool with any of the budget, especially uh, what the previous speaker was mentioning, we're going to have a serious uh, fiscal calamity. So I urge you people to adopt the budget as presented this evening. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else who would like to speak to this issue? Seeing none, we will close the public hearing. What are the wishes of the council? Councillor Reid. Um, Madam Chairman, I'm not running for election or not running after serving three terms, so I'm just going to uh, take a couple of minutes. In going um, through this process, one of the things that councillors try to do is provide the services that the town needs and also to keep the tax rate uh, reasonable. Um, we tried very hard to come up with solutions to reduce the tax rate uh, down further, but quite frankly, although I personally would like to see a reduction in the tax, I have not heard tonight with a room full of people, nor with this uh, amount being out in the public, uh, anyone saying that a 3% increase in taxes is not reasonable to assume. So although personally I would like to reduce the amount of money collected from taxes, I cannot hear as a representative of the people when I have heard no one ask me to do that. And when we did it last year, nobody seemed to notice. Um, so I will vote to uh, accept the budget uh, as it is. Thank you, Councillor. Councilor McGinty. Um, as I said earlier, we did go through the process, and uh, I certainly respect the school board and uh, certainly Charlie Greer, who was the finance chair, and, and, and Chapman and the whole school board. Um, and my intent was not to try to reverse what they, um, the, the, the budget they came to. Um, I certainly support the schools 100 um, percent. In reference to Mr. Adams' comment, uh, we've been saying, all of us, school board and town council, we're trying to look at the town as a one town concept, that we're all in this together, that the taxes all come out of the same pocket. Doesn't matter if it's school board or community services or wherever it's coming from, it all comes out of the same pocket. So we need to look at the town budget overall and, um, you know, make necessary cuts where they can be made, uh, provide the services we think need to be made. My issue with the budget is that I think we there's room for reductions um i i don't think that we need to increase the tax rate a total of 52 cents as i promised to the school board that we wouldn't rehash this issue again tonight we had on order of seven or eight workshops and meetings uh, we discussed these issues i philosophically disagree with some of the fellow counselors on some of the issues um, as i said i'd like to use some of the undesignated surplus to reduce I'd look for other areas to reduce. Um, I'd ask the town manager to look for areas to reduce. Um, having been on the, the losing end of the votes, you know, that's politics. That's the way it works. Um, we follow the procedure. Um, this is the end game. Um, and I still believe that we can cut the rate of increase. Um, however, if the votes aren't there, the votes aren't there. Councilor Groff, excuse me. <clears throat> this was my first year going through the budget process. And when I ran for town council, I indicated that I thought it was necessary to bring to government uh, better business practices, that government needed to be run more like a private business. And I still believe that. Um, I've been a little, quite candidly, a little disappointed going through this budget process. Not disappointed in the town manager at all, because the proposed budget that came from the town manager was uh, 
a very good piece of work. It laid out the options. It was there for all to see. And then there was an all-day Saturday budget hearing after for the town council. This is setting aside the school board for a minute. And department heads came in. And I heard very little from town councilors at that time as to specifics. And there was some discussion earlier tonight by Councilman Ginty about why his memo was prepared. And it was prepared at my behest, because I got tired and frustrated of hearing general objections to the budget without the specifics. If somebody's going to say, no, I don't want that tax rate to increase, I don't want to spend more money, that's easy to say. What's hard to say is, tell me where, show me how much, show me what impact that will have on town services, and let's do it line by line. That's where I felt the process wasn't as rewarding as I thought it would be. Um, I think this is a good budget, and it's a good budget in large part because of the town manager's hard work. Uh, I think next year, I, having gone through this learning experience, will be in better shape to be able to have a better understanding of priorities early and focusing energies on meeting our priorities and trying to draw people out as to exactly what they could save and why and having a discussion about that. Those discussions just weren't illuminating this year. I'd like, perhaps it's because the town manager did such a good job, but perhaps it's because we have a tendency, I thought, to skip over the process more than we had to and not focus on the issues in the appropriate form. Or, and then we get to the school board. I am very much in favor of the school budget. I think the school board did a good job. I think next year the school, bo school board with our new superintendent, and not an interim, is going to recommit to taking, to examining how we run the schools. And I think next budget season is going to be a very interesting process. I've heard that from the finance chair, and I fully anticipate that there will be lively discussion at this time next year. But the school board as a whole said that that discussion wasn't relevant couldn't happen this year without a leader of the ship. And I am not going to second guess the school board about that decision. I'm going to do nothing but uh, thank them for all their hard work. So overall, I'm going to vote for this budget. Is it perfect? No. Are there things that have been specifically identified in this budget that I can stand before the public and say, I want to cut, that have been thought out? and have been explained sufficiently to garner the necessary support? No. And that's why this budget for this year is the best that this town can expect. And that's, and that's why I'm going to support it. Councilor Jordan. No, I just want to say I have no, I suppose I'm going to say I have no problems with the school board. I asked Charlie Greer the Chairman of the Finance, if there was any way that he felt they could do something different, and he said no. And I left it there, but I opened up a can of worms, been doing it with other <coughs> members. I just thought it was a fair question, and it's a fair question, but I don't disagree with 100% of the missile budget, because as I see the budget for next year, there's an employee that's getting done, and the salary's in there for what his salary is as of now. And I don't think that's a fair way to budget. And I think there's other areas. I don't think we used as much salt and shit and sand last winter. And I don't see why we should budget for the same amount. And there's a few areas that, like that down through the budget. I think some savings could, made, could be made. And I would like to reduce the budget. That's all I have to say right now. Thank you, sir. Would anybody like to make a motion? We're looking at you because it's generally procedural. Uh, I would defer back to the chair. I can't chair. Make that motion. 
I don't make motions. She Go ahead, Councilor Groff. Thank you. Well, I'll make a motion that. Uh, That item number 190, general fund budget, be ordered uh, town, the Cape Elizabeth Town Council, having held a public hearing on Monday, May 5th, 1997, does hereby adopt the municipal budget for fiscal year 1998 with gross expenditures of $18,330,641 and gross revenues of Five million four hundred sixty-one thousand two hundred ninety-seven dollars, and with the amount of twelve million eight hundred sixty-nine dollars, twelve million eight hundred sixty-nine thousand three hundred forty-four dollars to be raised by taxation. And does further fix Friday, October third, nineteen ninety-seven, and Friday, April third, nineteen ninety-eight, as the dates upon each of which one half of such tax is due and payable with interest to accrue upon taxes due and unpaid after each such date at the rate of 10% per annum. In accord with 36 MRSA section 506, the tax collector and town treasurer are authorized to accept payment of taxes not yet committed or prior to any due date and pay no interest thereon in accordance with 36 MRSA section 506 capital A, a taxpayer who pays an amount in excess of that finally assessed shall be repaid the amount of overpayment plus interest from the date of overpayment at the annual rate of 6% per annum. Um, I don't know if you have to read all the No. Do we have to read D, E, F, and G? No. Right. And you can reference them as presented. And I reference paragraphs B which uh, is the amount fixed as the gross appropriation for each department and agency for fiscal year 1998. C, uh, which is ordered the Cape Elizabeth Town Council hereby accepts the categories of funds listed below as provided by the state of Maine. And there are ra various revenues. Um, D, ordered the Cape Elizabeth Town Council hereby appropriates from Foundation allocation for school purposes, the sum of $7,532,481. And the town of Cape Elizabeth raises as the local share of foundation allocation the sum of $5,122,272.89. E ordered that the Cape Elizabeth Town Council hereby raises in addition local educational funds, education funds under the provisions of 20-A MRSA section 15614, the sum of $4,426,339.11. Ordered the Cape Elizabeth Town Council hereby authorizes the expenditure for the fiscal year beginning July 1st, 1997 and ending on June 30th, 1998 from the foundation allocation, the debt service allocation, unexpended balances, local appropriation, state subsidy, and other receipts for the support of schools, the sum of $12,162,245. And finally, don't all applaud. G, ordered the Cape Elizabeth Town Council hereby appropriates for adult education the sum of $127,593.91. And the town of Cape Elizabeth raises as the local share the sum of $47,593.94. Very good. We have a second. Second. Thank you. Further discussion? Councilor Cogsell. Yes, I would just like to say, um, Although I'm, I'm sorry we have to ra raise the tax rate, as others have expressed, there's been a genuine effort on the part of both boards to tr tr truly evaluate our needs. Um, I know we as citizens need to do more to lo lobby in the state to try to help um, keep the school funding formula from being distorted further, that perhaps both the town council and the school board need to focus more on regional approaches to providing services, this is both through the school and the town, or sharing of towns, that there is one slightly built-in little bit of protection for the school board uh, budget in that 1996 we had uh, a 72 cent uh, impact on the tax rate which is currently there for the bonding for the school project and each year that drops 35,000 as far as the debt we have to pay, which means 
there's still 35,000 and then 70,000 and then 105,000 and it keeps accruing like that that's already built into the tax rate on the school side. So along with a very um, thorough examination by both bodies, I think that probably we will hopefully have it stabilized for at least another year. Thank you. Councillor Reid. I was just um, listening, and I probably just didn't hear this, and Council Graf said it, but in addition to the fine work of uh, the town manager, the business manager was also very important in providing us with the accurate and up-to-date information and the, uh, the uh, receive the change in the morning and have it uh, to the town manager by noon, I think is wonderful, and I want to thank uh, the business manager as well and the town council and the now permanent superintendent for two years. Thank, Thank you. you. When I spoke earlier this evening, I spoke about how important and very special the people of this community are. And I do want to extend my thanks also to those very dedicated people who put together the budget document for the council to review. Some of the department heads did their best budget presentation that I've seen in nine years. I was very appreciative of that. And I know some of the work that goes on behind the scenes Thank you, Michael. Well done. Councilor Lunell. Yes, I'd uh, like to thank everyone in, involved in the process. Uh, from our business manager, certainly. Uh, the um, people, I think most people are aware that the, the school funding formula has decreased for Cape Elizabeth this year. At the same time, student population has gone up. Uh, that's a, a hard spot for the school department, department to be in. Um, I'd also uh, like to thank our finance chair, Councilor McGinney, for his work on this. I regret that we didn't, uh, weren't able to sharpen our pencils a little more, and I hope that if um, some money is found in the future, uh, that we're, that uh, we are very careful what we do with it. Thank you. Is there any further discussion? All those in favor of the motion. All those opposed? Five to two, McGinty and Jordan. Thank you. I would ask the council if there is anybody who has objection to taking items 191 through 196 as a lump, as one motion, as a lump, lump motion. Yeah. Seeing no objection, I would entertain a motion. So Council McGinty, would you like to read? At least I read them all. The titles are? Just, just, the titles. just the titles. Yes, please. You can say yes presented. Um, item number 191, sewer fund. Item 192, Riverside Cemetery Fund. Item 193, Portland Headlight Fund. Item 194, Spurring Church Fund. Item 195, Fort Williams Park Capital Budget. And one item 196, the Thomas Jordan Trust Budget. The motion was for those as presented. Second. And second. Any discussion on any of those? Yeah. Council McGinty? No, as presented. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> All those in favor of the motion? All those opposed? 7-0. Thank you. Item number 197, proposed reduction in the school sewer user fee.